We'll wait for the assembled masses here. I think we're good. Uh, <clears throat> Jim Hackman is going to take a few minutes and uh, wrap this meeting up. Um, he reminded me, I had to tell a story about him, actually. Hank, Hank asked me to do this. Um, <laughs> many, of you, many of you don't know. Jim, Jim reminded me, I've known him for 50 years. Uh, it's a, lot, a lot of you may not know, Jim started graduate school in Chicago. And uh, when Al Reese left Chicago, moved to Princeton, uh, Jim actually changed graduate schools. And uh, so that old story about the fact that, you know, he had, a, he had his bags uh, in Ohio somewhere, because you never knew he was in Chicago or New Haven. Uh, that was started a long time ago. Uh, the, uh, and I still remember when he came to visit, I was a graduate student, and we spent like all night long talking about economics in some horrible dorm room somewhere. Uh, Jim eventually ended uh, up coming to Princeton, and uh, here's the story I'll tell you. So the uh, uh, the story is told <clears throat> whenever I'm introduced at, at Princeton by Uwe Reinhardt, who's a, a, a distinguished colleague of ours and health economist and a very well-known guy. And he always tells the story, and I, for the life of me, I couldn't quite remember that I had done this, so I checked with Jim, and it's a true story. Uh, <laughs> so the story is uh, that uh, Jim, I don't know how he did it, but in, in those days, uh, the economic chart was located in Dickinson Hall, which is now the history. You know, it's one of the one of the, the class, you know, the collegiate Gothic buildings. Looks like uh, the building, the old buildings at Chicago. And uh, Jim had an office in there uh, next to Reinhardt, who was an assistant professor at that time. And uh, every once in a while, I would be doing work. We would work at night, and I was working in the library. Jim was working in his office. And uh, <clears throat> every once in a while, I would come up with something that I was interested in and want to talk to him about it. And uh, apparently that night, the problem with Dickinson Hall was that I didn't have a key to get into it. So I couldn't actually get to Jim's office. So I'm walking along Washington Road, any of you know where Princeton is, I'm outside of Dickinson Hall, trying to figure out how I'm going to get into the building. And uh, all of a, I, I suddenly I noticed that his window's open, uh, coming out onto Washington Road. So I thought, well, this is no big deal. You know, I'll just climb in the window and say hello to you. Well, it turns out my colleague, uh, Reinhardt, was coming into Jim's office just at that time, and he sees this apparition. Uh, you know, someone's climbing in your window. <laughs> so I, I climb in the window, and, I, and it's reported by Uva. I don't remember this. Uh, I, I reportedly, I, I finally climbed in the window and said, I've got the proof at last. I have no idea what the hell it was. <laughs> anyway, something. So Jim is going to talk to us a little bit. Uh, he's an old friend, been around. We've known each other for a very long time. And it's always a pleasure to, uh, to have him reflect on whatever he wants to reflect on. Some people I know need to leave here shortly after 1.30, so just a warning. OK. <laughs> Jim, it's please. a quality index. I won't take it seriously. OK, well, thank you very much. The story is true. But it was a first story office, so Worley was not a second story man. <laughs> <laughs> and you have, did have to climb over a trellis, though, so there was work. Yeah, the story's completely true. Well, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, and, and Orley's right that this, uh, we go back uh, 50 years, and Bob and I go back 30 years at least, around 30 years, I think, right? You came to around 86 or so at the University of Chicago. So, I want to talk a little bit about Bob. And I was asked to talk about his work. I'm not sure I can really do that. I mean, we've heard a lot of good things about him, especially last night. And I certainly don't want to uh, uh, spoil the mood that was set from last night. But I would say that I have found him, like others here in this room, to be an incredibly gracious and uh, uh, intelligent and informed uh, colleague. Uh, and wherever he was, whether he was at the business school or whether he was at the Harris School, he uh, was uh, very interactive with me and with everybody who was interested in empirical research and economics. And uh, he still is. In fact, I'll tell a story. Uh, as of this Tuesday, we had a workshop uh, with a graduate student. I don't think he's here today. But uh, uh, a student who was giving a kind of an early version, in fact, way too early version of his, uh, <laughs> of his uh, PhD uh, proposal. <laughs> 
And, uh, but he said, oh, Bob is going to come. I said, oh, that's fine. So we were in the room, and we, you know, we were waiting for a while. And then it turned out, you know, we waited for about five minutes. So it started five. The guy was 5 to 620. But I think the message got mixed up. And so as we were leaving around 620 or 630, there was Bob coming into the workshop. So you came, but it was a little bit too late. But I think you ended up talking with Colin about his work. And uh, so I think that's uh, a sign of just his devotion and his intellectual, uh, his, his, his commitment to serious research. And I will also point out, in terms of my personal relationship, this is partly a committee uh, aspect, and, and that is with uh, Dan Black and Bob and I had for many years, and some of you I see in this room are alums of this sequence, a class on the economics and econometrics of evaluating social programs. I think it was a pretty successful sequence. We had a lot of students, both econ students and Harris School students and some business school students who took the class. And I think it was, it was a very, very good sequence. And it was really integrating empirical work with econometric work and really trying to go to, to try to craft a group of students who were really quite uh, strong. And many of those students did very, very well. And Bob played an enormously uh, uh, important role, as did Dan, so I don't want to <laughs> slight him. Uh, but it was, it was a very good sequence. And uh, I think it's a little bit sad that it's been terminated or hasn't really been transformed. So you're coming a little bit more uh, abstract, maybe. You're the last remnant of the sequence, right? So. So, so as a teacher and advisor, uh, he is just amazing. And in fact, we had many PhD students together. Um, and we still do. And uh, the, in every case, uh, he's played a, a, a really powerful role in the sense of working with them. Derek talked about tables. And uh, that's only part of the story. The rest of it is just kind of getting the student to ask a question, to address it in a serious way, uh, to kind of understand the economics of the problem, and to understand the econometrics of it, and, uh, and to do that in a consistent way. And sometimes, and I will say over the past, without mentioning names, there have been some stormy encounters between some advisors, you can't imagine whom, and their students. And these students, and he always smoothed. I won't mention the names of the student, <laughs> but there was one guy who, sent, who was sending around insulting emails to his whole committee. It wasn't just to me in particular. And <laughs> Although I, I'm sure they were directed in part towards me. And, and Bob really calmed him down, and the guy stabilized and went off and had a pretty good career. So that's, uh, so I would say it, it, it's an important role. It's a very important role. But also, he played a very important role in suggesting ideas and improving the ideas of the student. So Orly asked me, Orly and um, David Card asked me, and I guess John did, but John, you were less active on the email, so I'm not sure to whom to thank or tribute. Just to talk briefly about lessons from his life's work. And I want to I wanna talk about that. But if I can, I'd like to frame the issue a little bit. So I'll go back to Princeton. I'll go back to Orley, actually. And I'd go back to the late 60s, actually, in Princeton, and kind of put this work in perspective. But of course, I want to consider the 86 paper, uh, the AER paper, which is a basic paper, and had a huge influence, I know, on many people here, including uh, myself. Uh, so w what I want to try to do is uh, talk about the last 40 or 50 years. And you'll notice the second part of the title is the Credibility Revolution, which is a title that many people have used and are continuing to use in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. But Bob played a very important role, I think, in this uh, understanding. And I just want to make a theme which I think is useful and kind of put him in context, I put Bob in context. And that is, I would claim, and I think many people here and Orly, please feel free to stop at any point and contradict why we shouldn't break a lifetime pattern here. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's part of the pleasure. It's part of the pleasure. So, people are talking about the intensity of Chicago. Orly brings a certain intensity to everything he does, and it's uh, intensity, joy, and pleasure. But in particular, I would argue, and if you've been around long enough, you can see that economics tends to move in cycles, right? I mean, I don't know how many times have we seen linear quadratic cost of adjustment models, at least two or three times. Once when I was a graduate student in my early years, and then it's being revived. So it's, it's natural, it's easy to do, and, and, and people forget. Maybe it's good, because it gives jobs for the next generation. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully, economics is moving forward. In, in, in some sense, there's going to be some, some movement upward. 
And I think that actually microeconomics has moved upward. It's moved up a lot partly because of the data that we have, partly because of the work of Bob and, and Orley and many others in this room. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it, there has been a general positive trend. I want to talk about this. I want to frame Bob's work. So just talk very briefly. Bob is most famous for this paper, which I will now display. This is, I'm not going to go through the whole paper, but this is the famous paper that I think has is, is, you know, launched hundreds of studies, and I think uh, properly so. Uh, but this paper has a history itself. I want to talk a little bit about the history, about why it was so important, this particular paper, and where it fit in the context. You know, last, uh, this, the last few weeks, uh, there's been a special, I don't know how many of you read the New York Review of Books, but Sandy Jinks actually has been writing on the war on poverty. Was it a success or a failure? And I don't want to debate that unless you want to switch topics and it'd be a good <laughs> subject. But, but, but the point is, is about 50 years ago, the war on poverty was launched. And the reason why that was interesting, and I don't know the answer, I don't know the origin of this, but part of that launch was an emphasis on evaluation of programs, right? It was written in, the Office of Economic Opportunity. I don't know if you can attribute it to a single individual, but evaluation became part of the, the theme. And that was education and training programs, which were an important part of the war on poverty. So Head Start, uh, job training programs, um, income maintenance programs, and the like. And it's an amazing uh, legacy. Uh, you know, the, there were early papers. But actually, at Princeton, I don't know if Orly remembers this, and I don't know if you remember her name. Who is the woman who launched the, uh, the NIT uh, studies? The negative income tax studies. Heather Ross. Heather Ross. You got it, Heather. You had the same problem. I, I remember the Heather, but so long the Ross was. And I can't find out where she is. But in the late. She was a grad student at MIT. She was very entrepreneurial. And somehow she convinced the Office of Economic Opportunity to evaluate a policy proposal, which was to you know, basically give transfers uh, of the sort that we know as the negative income tax. And we know that it had a whole demand for economists to understand what the consequences of these programs were. And it was run by Mathematica and it was across the street, really, from, at that time from the industrial relations section, right? Because that was founded by uh, people like uh, by Baumol and Quant and others. Okay, so what happened then is there was this great interest and two parallel strands came out of this. And one was trying to understand income and substitution effects because that was the essence of understanding what the responses were. And it led to a big non-experimental literature on which many people were working, including me. Orly and I wrote some papers on that. Glenn Kane played a very important role, recently died. Um, but also, Heather Ross came out and said, look, we're going to have real trouble. And, G and Glenn Kane and Al Reese, uh, previously mentioned, these people were also very deeply concerned about the state of the art on non-experimental evaluation and especially understanding what the labor supply estimates were. And I'll show you an example of why they were so concerned. But there was a huge literature that was started to develop in parallel. And Bob plays a very important role in this. And the, and the, but the early literature that was non-experimental literature, definitely dealing with what I think are important problems, selection problems, attrition, non-response, and so forth. And we know that there was a lot of a, a focus on this. But the early work also was relying strongly on distributional assumptions, linearity, and so forth and so on. So what happened in, as you go through the course of the 70s, and we go up to this paper here, was there were two strands. The negative income tax experiments were conducted. But ironically, I always consider this ironic, by the late 70s or early 80s, everybody considered them to be a failure, right? Kogan had this paper. He testified before Congress. And the view was, because of all the attrition and non-response and all these other questions, it was necessary to use non-experimental methods to estimate the experiment. And then people, many people found that to be disappointing. And I, I think in the end, the view was that the experiments weren't that good. But meanwhile, there was a second strand of literature. And I will show you that strand of the literature. This was a strand of literature that was in the background. It's mentioned in the paper by Bob. But this is just before now. So I'm not going to take a lot of time about the history of, uh, of leading up to Bob. But I want to talk a little bit about Bob. And so there were two papers, and he cites both of these papers. One was a paper by David Hendry called, uh, well, the title, Econometrics, Alchemy, or Science. <laughs> and, uh, but, but what he really should have said, there's a, there's a term missing in front of it. It's time series econometrics. <laughs> <laughs> but, that's, but, that, 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 but nonetheless, he, uh, and of course, but Hendry actually didn't think it was alchemy. And he had, so it, what, what Angus later called the hendrification procedures. Uh, <laughs> he hendrified his data, and he's still going. I just saw him last weekend, and he's still 
still believing in the specification test. So that was one line. And then a little more uh, applied uh, to micro problems, was, but also time series, was the paper by Lemer. And uh, take the con out of econometrics. And he did what a form, you might think of it as a Bayesian bounds analysis, where, but all with linear regressions. And so there was a, a, an atmosphere out there that a lot of econometric work was not good. This was happening at the same time, I, I point out, is there was some, you think it's unfair to say that many people kind of were disillusioned by the experiments? Well, I mean, they, they good. <coughs> always asked them, there were several experiments. Right, the New Jersey, yeah. the Seattle, Denver. The Correct. The new house. Yes. Well, that was, I think that's fair to say. I, actually, I don't know if you did, but I, as a graduate student, I actually enrolled people in Trenton into that experiment. That was, I was working with Reese, and I went around door to door and got people to sign up for uh, the experiment. I don't know how, I didn't follow them afterwards, but uh, the, they're definitely, I was engaged. So always interesting. So these two strands are there. So then Bob arrives on the scene. But let me tell you a little bit about the scene. There's a paper by Killingsworth, a book by Killingsworth, actually on labor supply. But this is in a handbook of labor economics that Orley and Richard Laird edited, I guess, the first, uh, first volume of the handbook of labor economics. And this was a survey of what the labor supply elasticities were. These were the same elasticities used for negative income tax. And it was tables like this. In fact, I singled myself out here uh, on what the implied elasticities were. These, this was a case where the functional forms were strong. We think that we now know that the sum of the linearity Normality assumptions just weren't that appropriate for a labor supply, just given the, the, the fundamental nonlinearities. Uh, and but the labor supply estimates were pretty amazing. Uh, I don't have a pointer, but if you look, for example, at procedure 4A, which I can't tell you is, uh, the labor <laughs> supply elasticity was like 14, uh, and it wasn't just me. Uh, it was other. Oh, here's Dooley. He's had a 15, so he beat me. <laughs> But it went all over the place. And so without going through all these estimates, a feeling was really in the air at the same time, just before Bob, that we really couldn't. The non-experimental methods weren't that good. And people tried various specification tests. So I don't want to go through all these tables, except to show you that there were a lot of estimates. And some of the initial skepticism that led to the motivation of the first experiment was in the air. And then a second was a book that came out at almost the same time by Lewis. Uh, Lewis wrote the first book on Union Rage Effects, the 1963 book. I don't know how many people in this room have actually read the book. Anybody? Ah, amazing. No, you read the book. I know that. OK, David Card. Uh, OK, David, did you read the book? Absolutely. I reviewed it for KEL. <laughs> Wait, the first book. Oh, the first? oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've read the first one. Yeah, the first one. But how long did it take you to read the first chapter? <laughs> With the triple subscripts and the quadruple superscripts. <laughs> yeah, but if you look at it, it's an amazing book. Anyway, there's a second book, though, that he wrote. And again, I don't want to. So the point that came out of it is he had different methods, inverse Mills ratio, OLS. A lot of these were from that era. And uh, he, he called it U-hat estimates, were two-stage least squares, basically. And so without going through all of these estimates, I'll just read you this. So this was very much in the air when Bob was doing his work. But there was a sense that non-experimental methods were not that good. But it was done in the sense that, you know, this was kind of carping. And then he went on to other estimates. And you can talk about each of these, the, each of these essays. But I think this was a, an important, uh, it, it helped kind of set the ethos. So let me come back to this. I don't know how much time do I have. I don't want to, I can stop at any moment. But I, I'll talk a little bit. What? OK, fine, perfect. So I'll just go through. This is the table that Derek was talking about yesterday. But I realized I made a mistake. This is from the, the 86. These are very self-contained tables. Unfortunately, I've destroyed the story because I cut the base of the table. <laughs> Each table is carefully documented so that you could read the table on its own. That was, I guess, the Princeton rule. I guess, is that David Card's, uh, or is that Orly? I'll let him fight it out. OK. <laughs> but anyway. But here is, here is the study. And it, it, it showed kind of many things about his, uh, his style and his research. But what it does show is you know, here are the data. He had these different comparison groups. 
He discusses the value of the comparison groups, and he lays it out. So without going through all the details, the treatments and controls are in the first two, co first two columns of numbers, and, uh, or the, first, or the tr uh, treatments and controls columns, and then the comparison groups that were used, plausible comparison groups used. And, and uh, th that was for women, and a similar table for men. And you can see that already the comparison groups were enormously different in many cases from the, the original group. So, there, so he does a number of studies looking at the econometric methods that were in vogue in the day. And you know, he, it's not completely, it's not negative. It's not, uh, it's not negative at all. But what it is is that it, it's really suggesting that the kind of uncritical use of a lot of these methods that were standard in the literature could lead to wildly different estimates. Okay? So, and, and there are other estimates as well. So there was a pushback. So there was a pushback. Here's one of those. On a paper I wrote with Joe, and we interacted a lot with Bob on, on when he was at the business school on this. And this was the case, well, maybe we could use specification tests. There was another pushback in some sense that Dehijva and Waba wrote this paper a few years, about a decade later, published it a decade later, showing that maybe matching would overcome it. And then a couple of the authors here in the room challenged that. So it led to a sense that it still didn't settle the issue. So I honestly think that sometime as a result of this 20, 10, 15 years of activity, and here I don't want to pick on Banerjee, I have high regard for him, but just crystallizes what I think was a thought process, is the beauty of randomized evaluations is they are what they are. We can compare the outcome of the treatment and outcome of the control and so forth. So I think it, it led, I think Bob's paper led to a general, I remember when you gave the paper at Gary Becker's workshop years ago, that Becker was, became and said, oh, we really, these experiments are really very important for understanding. I think he was, that shaped the thinking. Your, your study had a powerful role. So I don't want to say Banerjee only read your paper, but it's clear that randomization uh, was heavily influenced by the difficulty in facing non-experimental methods. So no question. But a general question has been raised. And so again, since I have five minutes, I'll give the very short version of it. So here's the classical linear regression model. It doesn't have to be linear. A lot of interesting models aren't. But just take the linear model. And so the fact of the matter is, is that I would argue, and people could really contradict me, and they should, if it's wrong especially, uh, that, uh, that, you know, that certainly everybody was interested in this question. We want to estimate beta. And x correlated with epsilon was really important. And then gradually things transformed into making sure that x wasn't correlated with epsilon and maybe putting a little less emphasis on beta and exactly what it was and what it was stood for. So here, what I want to talk about is kind of where Bob fits into this. So here is a paper that he wrote with me, and I will use this. Maybe I can stop with this paper, just summarize. And Bob can contradict this. So this is, we, we did this together, and Jeff Smith is here too, so he can he can add, if we, but I'm quoting from the paper. So the question is, have you changed your mind? Maybe that's the <laughs> answer. So there, there were eight lessons. These are the eight lessons. And I, and I think these lessons are still timely. And I'll just stop with, I think, the eight lessons. And there's a lot more you can say, but let me just talk about this. The first lesson was that there are a lot of parameters. So the question about what's beta? You know, what question are we trying to answer? In all of Bob's work, he always had a very clear notion of what beta is. There was an economic problem, and it varied. And, and, as, he, and as we write here, and, and we wrote it, I mean, it was we as collective, that, that you know, there are a lot of heterogeneous impacts, and there are a lot of different questions. And so there is no single estimate, no single parameter of interest. And in fact, there are many parameters, and do you want to state the question? And a recurrent theme through all of Bob's work is following this line, that he does really lay out the economic framework very clear. The second is even though he helped launch this experimental mode, I think the latest passion, kind of got people moving and realizing how valuable experiments could be. I think it was a very important contribution. That he does also argue there's no inherently good method for choosing program. I don't know if you'd still agree with that. That it, it, you know, it depends on, on, on the economics underlying the problem and, of course, the data that were available. And I think his view, and it's certainly reflected in all of his papers, is that the economic question is, is what's front, front and center and you'll try to use the best available methods, credible methods, methods, and showing all the limitations of those methods as best one can. I mean, you can never be sure of all the limits, but and really understanding that. So that was, a, that was an interesting point uh, that he made. And then, of course, this is not anything that's going to shock people. 
But it really is the case, if you, like, if you go back to that very first table, that uh, you're going to find that a lot of those comparison groups, the difference between the control group of the experiment and the comparison group was like $19,000 a year versus $3,000. So you were asking an awful lot of the econometrics. And that's partly what the matching was doing, was partly you know, getting support and understanding, helping you to understand exactly that. And then, of course, this is also not too controversial. Uh, you want to compare comparable people. But I think this was actually not so common. When people are looking at what the median comparability was, and this has evolved. This has evolved, our understanding. I know that some of the papers here uh, were in particular focusing on, on how this might be done. And then this is a point that sounds almost like it's self-deprecatory. And it's, I think it's a kind of modified notion that Bob had about uh, non-experimental estimators. Um, he really wanted to interpret it. There was a feeling out there that you could feel competent. And Bob Fogel said this. Richard Freeman has said this. It's a, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a feeling that's correct. That somehow all different methods produce the same estimator, same estimate, sorry, that you feel competent. And you do. But it, really, the lesson is that there isn't much of a problem with bias in some sense, because these different estimators attack the bias problem differently. And so uh, that, that was important to say that was, but that wasn't the only success. So if you found two different estimators producing different estimates, you would take a different procedure. Some people were saying, well, all these things are worthless. It didn't help you decide which estimator was correct. So anyway, there was this qualification, which he, again, discusses a lot in his work. And then this is the, uh, I don't know if you would agree with this, but we did, he did write it at one time. <laughs> you can have, uh, you know, we know with some behavioral economic models that people have regret and time inconsistency. So, uh, <laughs> And it's also called learning, which is very difficult to discuss from a regret, but that's another story. Uh, so, uh, but clearly, uh, this I think is a guiding point of a lot of his estimator, a uh, lot of his point. Variability in estimates across estimators involve different assumptions and trying to understand. And so it's really just kind of repeating the, the, the sixth lesson. And uh, then the point is, is that experiments were really valuable. And they could really add. So it's another source of variation, which is exactly what Belin Kane was talking about. I mean, originally, when we're talking about labor supply estimates, people were really more interested in getting an exogenous instrument for income in a labor supply equation. And then the modern notion of using the experiment to define the whole effect, it was a later idea, actually, that emerged uh, as the literature evolved. But then there's this qualification, which Bob has noted and others have noted, that the threat of disruption uh, uh, you know, the non-compliance. We see versions of this in a lot of work today. This is the recent analysis, Pat Klein's study, for example, of the Head Start program and other studies. And, and, and the, the program, uh, many programs were basically we randomized people into the treatment, the controls. Just to show you the, uh, one table from this paper that we wrote together, you know, the fraction of the treatments receiving services and the fraction of controls receiving services varied widely across these different programs. And that adjusting for that really makes a difference. And some of the recent studies have actually shown this uh, and, and continue to show it. And then the final notion is one that we think of as called general equilibrium effects. It's the notion, well, we put this program in place, and uh, we know that that might lead to a very different notion of what a small local program would do from what a global program put on a national scale. And of course, recently there have been even experimental methods. Do flows work on this? Uh, very interesting. And uh, Jeff Smith and uh, and and, uh, and uh, your co-authors uh, in the study in uh, in the Canadian program some 10, 15 years ago. So the general equilibrium issue is a, is a non-trivial issue. So I guess I would maybe I should just conclude with this. I was going to talk about a few other papers, but I think maybe just to show the Ashenfelder dip. And uh, there it is. And it was interesting because this paper, which is important for its work on the earnings, I mean, is a huge paper, pretty illuminating what's going on in terms of, uh, of uh, understanding the earnings losses of displaced workers. It was also important in a narrower evaluation sense of just trying to understand the dynamics of what, would, and if you were choosing a non-experimental estimator, to use this. And the, and the sharp difference between the mass layoff and the non-mass layoff, very important lesson. So, and then maybe I can just conclude with this, just mention this paper, because John already talked about this earlier. I saw his slides. I, by the way, I should apologize for not showing up for most of the conference. No disrespect intended. But as some of you know, I'm a visiting committee. I'm a, I was dealing with visiting committees at the University of Chicago. 
And I got bogged, I accepted this long before this conference was planned, so I, I just showed up at the last minute here. But I did get John's slides. And this was very important. And it was very consistent with even with the finding from the early negative income tax study. So what happened was, of course, there's a randomized trial. And this was the genesis of the Ham and Lalonde and then Eberwein, Ham and Lalonde papers. And those papers uh, basically showed that if you really wanted to get things like duration dependence, understanding exit rates and so forth from states, that for certain parameters the experiment was ideal, just the mean employment rates for sure. But if you wanted to ask more subtle questions, given that you kind of interrupt, this is an employment plates program that you're talking about. So literally these people are all unemployed, they were enrolled in the program. Because they were enrolled in the program, they had the structure where uh, their spells were interrupted and then they start a new spell. The people in the control group had the old spell. And that gives us some non-trivial non selection issues if there's some heterogeneity and duration dependence. And they address those questions. So to me, that kind of takes it current. It's very consistent with one of the Lalande eight principles of truth, path to righteousness, or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was basically uh, that, you know, when we use the experimental data, so he, I was picking on Banerjee only because he stated it, he, he overstated it. He did it deliberately. You know, that's always a tactic that's useful in academic life. You know, the, that's a, you know, everybody knows the quote from Freud, right? You know it. No. You don't know this quote from Freud? No. Okay. Sigmund Freud had this great quote. He was asked when he was an old man, he was asked by a young man, how could I be successful in life? And Freud had one word that he used. He said, exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> So everybody exaggerates. We know that. Everybody, everybody exaggerates. That's the way it goes. So, so I think we can say that Banerjee was exaggerating in that particular phrase. But the fact of the matter is we've come to a modern understanding. And I honestly believe that a lot of this modern understanding stems from the reaction to the long paper. It was much more crystalline than the massive tables of numbers and Killingsworth. Or, you know, that was kind of a negative pitch. We had like you know, 300 labor supply elasticities, and clearly we didn't know which was the right one from that table, but we also didn't know how to proceed. And what Bob did is pointed out kind of not only how you might analyze the data or you might go forward, and then the later work is just an amplification and extension, and staying with the problem of training. So each of the studies of training was training, understanding the economics of training, understanding and interpreting what the economics were, and then asking some very big questions, not just all methodology questions, but asking, is job training effective? You know, can you actually, is classroom training effective? And these are very important findings. Uh, can you actually, are there successful ways to proceed? And he's consistently framed the issue of going back to the economics, the problem. So for him, there's never a question of what beta was. He knew exactly what beta was. And he answered these questions using multiple methods. So I am deeply grateful to Bob for his work. Uh, in, in his influence on uh, Chicago and influence on the larger profession. So thank you very much. <laughs>